Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Stephanie Call, the Product Marketing Manager for the Prometheus Instrument Lines at Nanotemper Technologies. I'm excited to share with you today some case studies examining how better understanding the stability of your protein and antibody formulations can ultimately improve outcomes in research. Let's begin by looking at the market for biologics. Biologics typically refer to the monoclonal antibodies used as some method of treatment. And as you can see, more are entering the market every year. As you can also see, the number which are entering the market is increasing every year. From a business standpoint, biologic therapeutics are an avenue of increased interest. However, as many of us know, there's a lot that has to happen to a therapeutic before it is ready to go to market. So what can increase success, whether you're a pharmaceutical researcher looking to make the next big breakthrough or an academic investigating new avenues of treatment? Antibodies and proteins of interest must be expressed and purified in order to be used for treatment or study. However, this is easier said than done, as many proteins prove difficult to work with and ultimately fail as treatments because they unfold or aggregate. Therefore, one of the best keys to long-term success is stability. But what is stability? There are many aspects to what makes a protein stable, and a lot of time in lab can be spent trying to determine these parameters for a large number of constructs. The earlier in the workflow you can find a stable protein, the better it is for everything that comes next. Nanotemper brings the Prometheus line of instruments, which are for doing broad biophysical characterization of proteins. With our latest offering, the Panta, we integrate three technologies into one instrument that can analyze these parameters in response to a temperature or chemical denaturation gradient. Let's learn more about each of these technologies before we see how they have helped researchers improve their workflows. The first technology is NanoDSF, or differential scanning fluorimetry. This uses the intrinsic fluorescence of a protein, wherein the tryptophan residues demonstrate an absorbance maximum shift from 330 to 350 nanometers upon unfolding. By following the ratio of 350 to 330 during a thermal or chemical denaturation ramp, we can determine a thermal dynamic melting temperature, Tm, or a midpoint denaturation concentration, Cm. The next technology is back reflection. Using near UV wavelength, we pass light through the sample and it is reflected back into the optic system. As large amorphous aggregates form, some of the light is attenuated and the amount of signal that comes back to the instrument is reduced. With this information, we can determine the onset of turbidity. Finally, we're excited to now offer DLS in tandem with these technologies. The DLS optics work by measuring the intensity of signals scattered at an angle from the sample. This intensity fluctuates based on the movement of molecules, which is ultimately related to the size of the molecules. We use an autocorrelation function to correlate these intensity fluctuations over time to the size of the molecules in the solution. The result of the autocorrelation fit is a measurement of the hydrodynamic radius of the particles in solution. What's important to note about this is that depending on many parameters regarding your protein, including buffer formulation, surface exposed residues, additives, age, or many other variables, there can be more than one particle size present in the sample. This is known as polydispersity, where there are multiple particle sizes. In the top panel, we can see a monodispersed sample where there is only one sharp peak indicating only one particle size. The bottom is an example of polydispersity, where there are multiple peaks, thus indicating multiple particle sizes, as well as broadened peaks that can indicate some unfolding or destabilization. The polydispersity index, or PDI, is a very helpful parameter for determining the overall quality of your sample and can be very important when finding the best conditions for therapeutic proteins. So how do these fit together? Here we can see Herceptin in three different buffer formulations. NanoDSF, back reflection, and DLS all demonstrate different parameters that help characterize how Herceptin behaves in different buffers. Note, for example, the much lower first th melting temperature for the pH4 buffers in purple and teal versus the PBS pH7.4 buffer in dark blue. Additionally, the back reflection and DLS data complement each other. The sodium acetate pH4 in teal shows no large aggregate formation. The addition of 130 millimolar sodium chloride in purple 
affects the unfolding by first leading to smaller aggregate formation at 63 degrees Celsius before crashing into large amorphous aggregates at 75 degrees. Meanwhile, the PBS sample rapidly undergoes turbidity onset at 81 degrees. So now that we've seen how nanoDSF, back reflection, and DLS can all work in tandem to create a full profile of protein behavior in response to temperature or chemical denaturation, let's look at how the technology has been applied in the lab. We're going to start by looking at how excipients affect storage conditions and monoclonal antibody stability. This work was done by Coriolis Pharma, which was interested in finding new chemical space for excipient storage. The problem, as they found, is that simply not much work has been done to characterize what molecules might improve long-term storage of monoclonal antibodies. Unlike small molecule drug discovery, which has many rules to create potentially effective drugs, excipient molecules have not been adequately characterized to determine what rules they must follow. Their solution was to screen a vast library of candidate molecules to better understand how they affected monoclonal antibody storage. However, with vast libraries, it's important to keep sample consumption low. And additionally, they wanted a parameter besides the melting temperature to use when screening their compounds. While the initial screen was completed with Cipro Orange technology, they turned to the Prometheus to refine their hits. The Prometheus afforded them a second parameter, the onset of turbidity, to select the best hits from their initial screen. The top panel shows how the onset of turbidity is increased for a selection of hits from the screen. In the bottom panel, they reevaluated the top candidates using nano DSF measurements to obtain full thermodynamic melting temperatures from the nano DSF data. You can also see from the first derivatives of this nano DSF data, several excipients had unique impact on the unfolding profile of the monoclonal antibody. Going forward, the next step would be to better define how these changes in the unfolding profile ultimately tie to the long-term storage stability of the antibody. Next, I would like to discuss a high throughput example looking at multiple constructs. This work was done by Janssen, who have long been enthusiastic collaborators with Nanotemper for their biophysical characterization. The group discovered an antibody that targets prostate cancer and it was derived from a transgenic mouse model. However, their model antibody, PCA75, was not stable enough for large scale use as a therapeutic. Their aim was to, to derive an engineered antibody that was just as potent of a therapeutic, but which was more stable and thus easier to produce. Their concerns during the process were twofold. One, the parent antibody has a high affinity for antigen, which they didn't want to lose during their refinement. Secondly, they created a large number of random mutants and therefore had many constructs to screen. Janssen turned towards the chemical denaturation capabilities of the Prometheus. They looked at the delta G or energy of unfolding for their various constructs. And as you can see from the top panel, their top candidate derived monoclonal antibody called PCA62 had a market increase in unfolding act, uh, activation energy compared to the parent molecule, PCA75. Both the full length and FAB region demonstrated this shift in stability. Likewise, they followed up by doing a full nano DSF scan and looking at how the shifts in melting temperatures and onset of aggregation were affected based on their derivative molecules. Lastly, I would like to talk about some exciting new research in the field of proteins as vaccine targets. This work was done as part of our early EAP program with TubeBind, another longtime collaborator, and is available currently as a preprint. In order to successfully develop vaccines, we need stable antigen proteins in order to study in the lab. One of the challenges of creating an HIV vaccine is that the native envelope protein has not made a good target for vaccine development. An engineered derivative, BG505 SOSIP has been developed, but requires further characterization for stability and vaccine development. TubeBind has a screen of FDA approved buffers for biologics development and wanted to know how these buffers affect the long term stability of the engineered HIV envelope protein. To do this, they wanted to do long term stability studies. However, by definition, these studies take time. 
And time from starting in the lab to final patient development is crucial in developing these vaccines. So they wanted to find something that would save them time in the lab. Additionally, they also had a lot of buffers to screen and didn't want to use too much material for each step along this way. Here we can see some highlighted data from the full screen. Buffer nine in black offered the highest melting temperature, which implies the most stability. On the other hand, buffer 70 in blue has the lowest TM, implying the least stability. However, as we can see, buffer 57 in red also has a fairly high melting temperature, but also was determined to have the lowest PDI of any of the buffers. When we look at the relative frequency versus hydrodynamic radius graph, we can see how buffer 57 does not have any higher order aggregates forming, but buffer nine in black does. Compare this also with the lowest, the least stable protein buffer 70 in blue, which also has a high PDI and shows that large aggregate molecules are forming. Compare this because of the insights gained from DLS, they went on to further characterize buffer 57 with accelerated stress studies and antibody interaction measurements, not shown here. Also important to note is that because the nano DSF, turbidity, and DLS measurements were all taken as part of the same measurement run, doing all these experiments was incredibly efficient. Not including the incubation times for the accelerated stress studies, the full workflow from 96 condition screen to stress studies with the final candidate required only about five days of hands-on time. The Prometheus is the new gold standard in protein characterization. We've just seen some of what it can offer researchers hoping to better understand their proteins in order to improve outcomes, not just at the bench, but later on in patient treatments. It requires low sample volumes and is easy to use, making it a great addition to the lab. We now have the Q&A session where you can join us in the Nanotemper virtual booth. I will be happy to talk in more detail about how these instruments work, other applications they can be used for, or any of the case studies addressed here today. Thank you so much for your attention.